Welcome to the Make It Work podcast. It's interesting seeing what you what you don't have to spend money on. That was kind of a really interesting thing for me because it's kind of everyone talks about the costs so much. I'm taking a risk and trying something brand, brand, brand new. Mm. It, like some of it is gonna flop. That's literally part of like the training I have in cloud is yeah. like to be able to flop and mm. like let things not work as well. Dreaded it for so long. I think for the longest time I was like, okay, fringe is horrifying to me. Great, that's why I should keep doing this because that's like really cool to like, to know that people like me are specifically going, this is for me, this is for me. All the bloody reviews that always just want to like compare me to Nina Conti. That's like, the, and oh. I'm always like, what, two of us is too many? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this mm. no matter what happens because I love this show. My guest today is Lachlan Werner. Lachlan was called the funniest new ventriloquist on the block by The Telegraph. He is a clown and live artist. Lachlan was runner-up for LGBTQ Plus New Comedian of the Year 2022 and a nominee for BBC New Comedy Award and Chortle Best Variety Act. He was also nominated for the Off West End Cabaret Award and Vault Comedy Breakthrough Award. His debut solo show Voices of Evil has been a total sellout hit. He is currently on a UK international tour with his first show while developing a second solo show Wonder Twonk. Welcome, Lucky. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, so I first became aware of you uh, when I saw you online. I saw a lot of your stuff online. And you have developed quite a large following online in recent years. Yeah, yeah, really recently, I think. I, yeah. I didn't, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't really doing it before, <laughs> the online stuff. And then, like, I think it's been, like, yeah, really in the last, like, year or so that I was like, okay, Everyone's doing the online thing yeah, now. <laughs> I think I have to do have it. To. Yeah. You've been doing ventriloquism for years and years and years. Yeah. I think I saw it from seven years old. Yeah. It's, how, yeah. How did you start at seven? Oh, gosh. I think it's the kind of thing that you only get into for, like, being a weird kid. And, like, <laughs> and uh, I was very shy socially not so much like privately with my family I think I really loved performing and wanted to be a performer yeah but and was like super creative wanted to make stuff and do stuff and yeah. loved like Jim Henson the Muppets all of that stuff was very like from a very young age was kind of like what I was into and then um yeah then found out about ventriloquism I think from like YouTube from the internet and was mm. like okay I think that's the sort of perfect in between for me where I can sort of be seen and hide at the obviously I didn't think this <laughs> coherently as a seven year old but like I think that's what it was was that it was like a thing of being like oh great I could be on stage but also no one's looking at me I can kind of right. have all the attention slightly diverted and say kind of all the things that I really want to like you know make jokes be naughty, say whatever I want to say, but like no one's gonna look at me. That attention is not actually directly on me. So yeah. yeah. And then I but I remember like my school and uh, you know, teachers and things picking up on it really quickly and being like, oh great, okay, so um you're gonna do like something in assembly this week, but you're gonna say it with a puppet. <laughs> like you're gonna like do it this and it, yeah. I think people were like it was a I, the, probably the reason I clung to it so much as well was because it was quite like encouraged actually. Mm. I think that it was like a thing that people were like, great, you are saying things now and you're yeah. like like you seem more present and like happy to be here when you're like sat with an imaginary friend. Yeah. You absolute freak child. <laughs> But yeah, it was, yeah, it, yeah, it worked for me as like a, a kind of tool for 
opening up a bit, I think. Oh my gosh, I'm a teacher myself. And I do think like, if I saw a child taking an interest in something like that, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit later then when <laughs> careers people were like, oh, and what are you going to do for your job? And I was like, ventriloquist. And they were like, no, oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm not so sure that yeah. this is to be encouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're shocked that I am doing it. That's like, it's definitely yeah. like, I feel like I've mainly continued doing it to like, spite those people yeah i told you i would do this yeah and (laughs) it i mean i wouldn't say i know of many people who are ventriloquists is it something you i mean you said you started on youtube is there somewhere you went to learn more about it or are you totally self-taught i know i was yeah pretty much totally self-taught i kind of uh yeah i i got the, the witch puppet that I perform with now is the same puppet that I learned how to do it with um, when I was seven. And yeah, I, I don't remember watching any kind of like tutorials or anything like that. I think it really was just that I kind of watched it a lot and was like, OK, I can start practicing kind of substituting letters. And then just like it's sort of like just learning another weird language, I think, where you just you literally get more fluent in in remembering to replace those letters all the time. Mm. Um, That's because yeah. you have a difficulty when you're not moving your articulators. So without moving right? your lips, there's, yeah, it's like, you're, yeah, you're mainly using just internal articulators, not kind of the yeah, external, it, you know, external things. Yeah. So it's like you're, you're mainly relying on your tongue and your kind of um, like the back of your throat and yeah, the kind of, the palette and it, it's 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 pretty much just all it's it's mainly replacing things with kind of uh g's and kind of k's and things like that i think that's like I've yeah. tra- it's such a weird thing to even try and break down because i feel like I, it's one of those things where i've done it for so long that when someone is like now explain it yeah, i'm like yeah. god i don't actually know what i'm doing no, <laughs> like, that's no. not like it's the least conscious bit of my work is the ventriloquism i think that's like just like wow. it's, it's so just now that in my head especially with brew the witch it's like okay that's just the other actor on stage with me and there's that doesn't really cross my whenever someone leaves a show and is like wow i never i didn't see your lips move at all i'm like oh god i forgot i was doing that like that's (laughs) like okay yeah i guess that's like still impressive like it's not really what i'm thinking about at all but like great i'm Mm. I'm glad that that's still like oh it's very impressive (laughs) very impressive and i was because i watched i watched your recent uh, gig on in la on film um and you know and then I had to watch some other because, you know, maybe it was a bit further back. Sure, but sure, when sure, I watched sure. some of your other things, I was like, yeah, I, couldn't <laughs> ha- I can't see any movement at all. Okay, I, I often occasionally in the middle of a show, I will panic and go, am I moving my lips? <laughs> like, because I just don't think about it. That I'm like, God, maybe this whole time I've just been like moving my lips and just don't even think about it anymore. So it's like. Yeah, I don't know. It, every now and then I'll record a, you know, a really close video or something and be like, oh, I can see them moving a little bit. Is that like, actually, I need to tighten that up. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, but yeah, it's it's like... Well, I didn't I see anything. <laughs> I did, what I did find particularly impressive was... You you did so, you do us you do some songs with the brew and you sing together um, and it's sort of line to line. Yeah. Uh, and I just think the muscularity involved in that must be quite complex. That is a little bit more. Yeah, that's like something that I, I don't do that at like every gig. And that's <laughs> something that when I am doing something like that, I do. It requires a little bit more warm up. It's like just just like, you know, the, the sort of diction <laughs> things of just like, yeah, making just it, it's like making stupid noises on the tube on the way to something to be like, okay, my tongue needs to be speedy. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, that, that's like, yeah, the one time when, and it's, yeah, it's kind of a brain back and forth thing. But again, I think it helps being slightly insane enough with this, <laughs> with this like puppet that I've had for so long that I kind of do see her as her own person. That kind of helps to not get confused because i'm Mm. in my head i am just like oh it's her line now Mm. (laughs) so it's quite easy to you know yeah i i think yeah for me it feels like i'm like i sing when it's my part and she sings when (laughs) it's her part and i'm not really aware that it's me doing both so 
you're self-taught with verse uh, with ventriloquism, but you also are a clown. You trained with Gaulier yeah. in France. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. and so can you tell us a little about what drew you to that? I, I think it was I kind of wanted to find a sort of, again, something kind of in between still working with the ventriloquism, but f- wanting to do a more theatrical show with it. I was very like, I guess I was aware that ventriloquism is like, it's been around for so long, but also still to me feels really unexplored. Still like feels like this very weird thing where even though it's like centuries old, you're still seeing the same centuries old, like act quite a lot of like kind of the same kind of formula with a puppet and a straight man kind of thing. And, um, so I kind of just wanted to find a way to break that a bit and was like, okay, there's got to be another way to sort of make theatre using this. Um, and Clown just seemed like a really exciting, like, avenue for kind of pushing myself the furthest I could as a performer. And, like, it's it scared me the most. I, I think out of everything, I, I thought, like, everything I've heard about this just makes it sound like the hardest thing in the world. And I kind of want to try it. Yeah, I think it's changed how I will work forever, probably, because it is just such a whole methodology in itself that's ah, entirely about play, entirely about, like, stupidity and not ideas not coming from the brain so much. And I think that has always been, like, something that I wanted to find was a more kind of, like, spontaneous way of generating ideas and not Mm. just kind of... I don't really like sitting and writing. It's not the way that I make things. So that just really appealed to me so much that there was this kind of other way of making theatre that was like devised, but also like devised uh, like largely with an audience and that you're so responsive to like what they enjoy and what they're into. And every show is different because of being so present in every room. And that like that, yeah, that whole way of working just was like, dreamy to me so this show you've been touring for a little while voices of evil yeah uh and so is that still changing depending on the audience yeah it does it does um i mean it's it's quite a set show now Mm. it's because it's been like two years or so in in development it's kind of now and especially kind of after Edinburgh, I think it, <laughs> that really solidified it as mm. a show and made mm. it like, OK, now I know not only the general script of the show, but also I even now have this sort of whole back catalogue of audience interaction <laughs> yeah. stuff that's quite easy to kind of depend on. Um, but, yeah, doing it on tour is like a whole other thing. And it really makes you realise how much we get used to really similar audiences, I think, Mm. in a lot of these sort of fringe spaces. It's like a very interesting thing of realising that the London scene and Edinburgh and even like, yeah, Brighton Fringe and these other fringes, like the people going to them have quite a expect... They they know what... They're a bit more aware of what clown is now. They're Mm -hmm. a bit more aware of what... um, I don't know, some of them are more aware of my work. And it's, it's... So that means there's a completely different expectation I think than like going to places that are just they're just coming to the show with no context and that really has like changed the energy of the show it's it's really cool to Mm. be able to be like okay this is a new challenge to try and make you laugh with none of the like context of what this is or what is happening and to yes still see how much I can kind of bring you along this journey with me um so yeah, that, that's changed. I think the, the tour, the shows are changing a lot more from show to show on tour than they do in sort of a Soho run or Edinburgh run or something, because I think the audiences are a bit more predictable for me in those spaces. Mm-hmm. Well, how did your relationship start with Soho? Because I believe you did a run at Soho prior to your Edinburgh run. Yeah, yeah. Um, it started because I did the... London Clown Festival there in 2022, Mm -hmm. um, which was just crazy. Like that was, it was, yeah, it all, the show sort of had this real weird moment where it kind of just started Mm. going in at full speed. I think Mm. it it was like, I developed it kind of slowly for a few months before that and 
had been working on it with uh, Laurie, who co-wrote and directed it with me. And Laurie um, Lux. Laurie Lux, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. She's also a, cl- a Gollier clown mm-hmm. and performance theatre maker and um, live artist, like w- wonderful, eccentric, crazy human being that, like, yeah, I can't kind of make things without her now. Um, and she, yeah, we'd worked on it kind of steadily for a little bit and done kind of just a few work in pro- progresses and then did it in Brighton and it went well there it was quite like picked up steam there Mm. and then I got asked to do the London Clown Festival and Soho kind of saw it there and it's like Mm. I mean that it whenever people kind of ask about like getting work in at Soho it's kind of an interesting thing because I feel like I had like the luckiest like (laughs) thing in the world to be able to just be at their venue and be like well I'm already here so you might as well come and see it and like yeah I think that's it's probably easier than than if you're like, will you come and see me in this like sure. pub theatre somewhere? Like, it was interesting though how much I think I felt that the show wasn't ready for that actually, right. and it was a really like crazy when we did the first. Then so then when they they asked us back for an, like the first run mm. that was yeah before Edinburgh, and I think it was even like a sort of weird thing where the perception was that I had already taken it to Edinburgh for a little bit. I think it was this sort of weird like thing where it was in, you know, it was sort of in that season straight after Edinburgh alongside all these other shows that had just done really well in Edinburgh. So it was like this very weird like thing where I was like, I still need to do that. Like (laughs) I I still have to like do all of that. But, But yeah, that first run, I remember like really frantically like upscaling it and being like, okay, between the, show in the clown festival and this one I now can see that it needs to grow a lot and Mm -hmm. like there is still so much work to do on it so that it really changed quite a lot between those Mm. those pockets of time because I think it was like okay this is now it's the time to sort of make it uh, yeah it felt like getting to dream a lot bigger suddenly Mm. which was really nice Mm. moving out of kind of small small fringe spaces with very limited tech and you know yeah. all of that stuff and being able to be like oh we can make this a theater show now which mm-hmm. is what we actually really wanted to do and and scaling up or developing shows for you and you said it's not writing what is it what does that look like i hesitate to say that it's not writing and i do actually really like writing in other projects it's sort of a weird thing where it's mainly just because i think because I know that I'm the person who's going to be doing the show mm. with a solo show, I can't write for those things. I think otherwise I really enjoy being a writer mm. and, and especially working on other people's stuff. I'm like suddenly very happy to switch into like writer, writer brain. Mm. But that's kind of why I love working with Laurie because I think she's a fantastic writer. So it's really nice to sort of be held in a devising process where you can come with all of the points of writing that you know you want to hit and sort of say, okay, this is the shape of the show that I want to do. Mm. I don't quite know how I'm getting from A to B yet. And I think those things mainly come from playing. The sort of A to B is definitely like the the dot to dot of, okay, um, I'm going to get from this narrative beat to this narrative beat with a game. It's that's kind of the the way that I think of it more, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, a mix of like writing some stuff by sort of just devising in a room and then other stuff from just gigging and, and playing with bits. There's quite a lot of the show, the kind of first half of Voices of Evil mainly came from gigs with brew that was kind of the the way of like making those bits was Mm. kind of just going okay we'll do sort of the the setup of the kind of spooky ritual that the show is based around and i'll play with some of the sort of games that i know i want to be in the show but in a kind of loose way and just see Mm. how some of those games work i guess more from the comedy angle and then you can start to think a bit more about it within the there were like some things in the show which were really funny but we just couldn't make them we really I think Laurie and I both I think really care about law quite a lot which is really fun we're really like precise sometimes with the sort of world building and being like this has to make sense though it could be surreal but it has to sort of still make sense and Mm. 
there were a few ideas that we loved and that I did at gigs and things that were really funny, but just we just like could not make them work within the show because we were like, no, but this, like the character of Lockie, can't, he can't understand ventriloquism in this way so uh, it has to be that we have to like to sort of keep the kind of clown logic <laughs> consistent <laughs> in the show that just can't be in the show because it doesn't make sense in this so yeah it was a lot of like looking at that kind of stuff and being like how much does this character understand what's happening and how much does this character you know how knowing do we want things to be or how right. like um so it's it is interesting kind of how much yeah trying to find like a balance of between the kind of gigging and then writing, like trying to find the balance of how much do you sacrifice a, like a laugh for the sake of being like the, the world building <laughs> has to be consistent. Like yeah. that's, yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe that's, well, I, I was about to say that maybe that's the difference between comedians and like theater makers, but then nowadays comedy is so, it's blurring those lines it's so really, much, yeah, isn't it? yeah. I'm sh you, they're making shows that kind of have a narrative journey yeah. and an emotional yeah. journey. Yeah, and yeah, I guess yeah. you're kind of, you're kind of in that world yourself in a way. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's what interests me. And then it's kind of weird sometimes realizing that my kind of work is placed in comedy because then I think I'd sometimes do stuff in slightly more kind of stand up spaces mm. and whatever. And I'm really like, Oh God, I really think I'm just like a theater maker. I really don't know if like, this is what I'm, I mean, I love it. I love those gigs as well. And I really enjoy like the, the feeling of subverting that space. That's kind of its own thing. But I think in my head now, the, the more that I do it, the more I think of them as quite different jobs mm. actually, that mm. like, it's kind of a thing where I'm like, okay, comedy gigs is one thing that I do. And yes, it's still with like some of the material from the show and it's with brew and whatever, but doing the show is like, I don't know, it feels more like a an acting job or something. You know, it's, it's a lot more like kind of, okay, I'm having to warm up. I'm having to like yeah. think, yeah, think about the writing, think about all of this, you know, that's, it's a very different like way of existing than I think just like showing up with like a witch in a bag and being like, okay, <laughs> we're just going to do some funny stuff for like 10 minutes. <laughs> In, in some ways, I mean, it is me playing the version of myself as a kid that needed ventriloquism. That's kind of what I think what it is, is like a, a thing of me kind of turning that into a game. The thing of being like, oh, I was so like shy that I needed to hide behind this thing. Mm. So what if now as a clown, I play with that? This like this person who can barely speak for himself and just like needs, like really needs her there mm. or just cannot even go on stage. Um that is kind yeah. of the story of, of your show as well, yeah. as like finding your voice yeah. and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, through, yeah. through a very a funny <laughs> sort of horror comedy yeah. genre. But yeah. there is that underlying um, finding yeah. your voice yeah, message, yeah, yeah. isn't yeah. there? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's funny. I always, I kind of, because the show is so bigged up as this like horror thing, <laughs> I forget that the actual sort of thing of it is so like wholesome and quite cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> like it's really quite like a, it's yeah, it really is just a sort of like, yeah. hey, come on, be yourself. Yeah. Like show. <laughs> but in this really weird, like horror, yeah, it's it's such a long way around to like say yeah. that, I think. But, yeah. But when you're making, do you did you come in with sort of this is what I want to say? Um, no, not really. I think sort of there was kind of a a prototype version of this show which is it's so funny because it was never a, that version was not a horror show at all <laughs> and it was actually it was sort of structured the same but it was a show where me and brew were hosts of a daytime tv show <laughs> that then kind of gradually dismantled it again it, the kind of same uh, arc for me I guess where it was like at some point she has to go away and the audience has to sort of be left with L Lockie and what mm -hmm. is he going to do without her and how you know mm -hmm. kind of what's in what happens then um, but yeah then we so I, so I guess the themes were already kind of there because it was sort of this thing of it being like okay what happens when a sort of using ventriloquism dramaturgically to explore this thing of kind of like what happens when you have to emerge without the thing that you're hiding behind. Um, but 
then we started the show and I think I didn't really know what it was going to be about for a long time. And again, there were a few versions before I kind of went, uh, there's like, there's one particular chunk in the show, um, a bit with me playing two, playing two characters with my body. And, um, that part came quite late in the, in the development of the show. I mean, I say late, but like, you know, maybe about six months into like making Mm. the show. Mm. And, um, to me, that is kind of the most like essential bit of the show. I think that was for me, the bit that made me really understand what the Mm. show was about and like, and yeah, what we were, what we were then trying to say, Mm. but yeah, it took quite a long time to get to. And initially I think I thought it was a show about just, I think I thought it was a show about bravery. I think that was like the thing that I, re- I was like, oh, it's just a show about what does it mean to be brave? And yeah. let's like explore that. And th- th- that's still kind of in the show. I yeah. still, there's, there's like bits throughout the show where my character is like consistently is like, be brave. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like still there, but it's, um, but yeah, then I think the sort of theme of sort of owning yourself a bit more and uh, kind of, especially kind of the idea of possession and what does that mean? Possession mm. and like possession of your body and possession of like those, that, those kind of things, I think, became a bit clearer mm. later on. And um, yeah, then it was easier to kind of write around it. And I find that like every time that I try and write something from that, from knowing what, I, what it is that I do want to say, yeah. I find it quite limiting. The show went to Edinburgh after Soho, yeah. and it did really well. You sold out the run. Crazy, uh, so your, crazy. And your French debut, and you were nominated for multiple awards. It's just crazy, like ridiculous, so ridiculous. I think I didn't, I dreaded it for so long. <laughs> I dreaded it for so long. I think for the longest time I was like, okay, Fringe is horrifying to me. The year before, I had, I had been up with a show with, a couple of other people I, just seeing the sort of landscape of it then I was like I never want to do this <laughs> like, I was like this is the worst like oh my god all my friends are suffering everybody like hates it here it's yeah I was just like this is awful but then the Soho run happened and all this and I was just like okay I, I think I have to do it this mm. year um and then again like again it was it's it was it is and what like was just so financially inaccessible to me I was always just like I'm never I don't actually know how I'm ever gonna do Mm. this like this is truly not really on the cards for me um and I just was really lucky that like it my friend Saima who um is a brilliant producer and uh worked for Tiger Aspect and got them to support the show which was just crazy Mm. um and then they also there was the first year that they did the phoebe waller bridge um fringe fund and i got that too and it was just like it was a it was a thing that where just sort of one thing after another kept making me go okay i have to do it this year Mm. (laughs) this is definitely like all the signs that it's that i should go for it now and that it's the right time and um yeah but i didn't think it was gonna go that well like it was just this weird thing where i think i'd really spent the months before really like building myself up going okay there's going to be days when there's like three people in the room there's going to be times when you get bad reviews there's going to be like all this all this horrible stuff that you know is part of it and I think actually the fact that I'd done the show for like already so long before that was a really good thing for debuting on one hand it's sad that the fringe feels like it's not to me a place where you can experiment so much anymore Mm. it's not as I think because of the financial inaccessibility inaccessibility it's not the same thing that it used to be where artists can go and be like I'm gonna build a show over the course of a month here and we're gonna just see what happens Mm. um or I think people the, the only people who I think can do that are the people with like a big production company behind them that are like yeah take all the risks and we'll yeah. you know market it well and make sure that you're still selling it all you know I think if you're taking something for the first time you don't have a producer or whatever it really feels to me like you have to you have to be in a place where you're like I think this show is the best it can be I think this is like 
the, the I'm, I'm going to enjoy this mm. no matter what happens because I love this show. You, you have to be in that place with it so that you can kind of back it fully as a producer. I think that's like the, the thing that yeah. it's like you have to be able to switch into that brain. And for me, I, I don't think I can't switch into that brain if I'm still in the sort of more vulnerable creative space of making something mm -hmm. and being like, okay, I'm, I actually just, I don't know if it's good yet. I'm making it like this. And some of the shows are not going to be <laughs> as good. Like when I'm taking a risk and trying something brand, brand, brand new, mm -hmm. it, like some of it is going to flop. That's literally part of like the training I have in cloud is yeah. like to be able to flop and mm -hmm. like let things not work as well. Like, that's its own part of the process. If you're producing and you, uh, you know, have to be in the mindset of being like, I am fully backing this. Like my, my, my money is going into it. I yeah. believe in it. I'm inviting producer. I'm inviting producers. I'm inviting uh, reviewers. I'm inviting everybody to come and see. It. I have to think that it's good. <laughs> like yeah. I can't really still be in that space of being like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so you had producer help during that time or you were um, still mostly doing it yourself mostly doing it myself yeah it was I had yeah I had a lot of great advice from producers mm -hmm. and from people that um that had you know Soho like were very supportive of the show and, yeah um yeah Saima a few people that are producers that was kind of around to mm. to turn to which was amazing mm. but it was yeah it was pretty much me doing it and yeah. that is like that I think that's actually oddly the thing that I'm proudest of from Fringe which is like it's a very weird thing to say because everyone's obviously like you did an amazing show smashed it whatever and like the comedy things that came from it is like fantastic but I think in my mind the whole time I was like I produced this this is crazy yeah. like I can't believe that like no one I did the right thing yeah. somehow like that was kind of yeah, the thing that felt weirdly the most exciting was mm. to be able to be like, oh, cool, you you can do this, actually. So what were the yeah. right things if you were going to, like, oh, what, what are the things um, you look back and you're like, tick, that was definitely the right thing for me to do. Um, Maybe I didn't know it at the time, but I think that was a right step. I, well, I think the, the main thing was, like, waiting until that year, actually, and not right. doing it earlier than that. I think mm -hmm. that was kind of the, the because it meant that I could get, reviewers in very early that was like the thing that you know mm. I I kind of knew that that was because I don't have uh, especially at that point didn't uh, people in comedy know, know who I am people outside of comedy don't know who I am so it was a thing of being like okay I a national press thing is going to help this a mm. lot I think that was kind of the main thing was going okay I if we can get them in very early in the run then that's going to kind of help the rest of it mm -hmm. sell and you know so that was kind of, I think, the, the, the biggest thing in a way was being able to um, I worked with a PR person and to be able to be like, hey, I would like the people in as soon as possible, please, so mm. that we can kind of get it, you know, hit the ground running a little bit. So and you did paid PR. You had a paid. Yeah. yeah I, did that, I mean, that. I think and that's smart in itself when you're competing in Edinburgh with yeah, thousands and yeah. thousands of shows. Again, I, I wish it wasn't. I it's a weird thing where, you know, like it's great to be able to work with them and it really changes it changes everything to be mm -hmm. able to be like okay someone is doing that for me and I'd done PR for myself as well for a long time so mm -hmm. it was really nice with Edinburgh to be able mm -hmm. to be like okay I'm handing that over which is amazing and to be able to not think about that is its own like thing mm -hmm. um and how did you find them? Was that some, was that word of mouth? Was that someone that you, um, it was, yeah. Other, other people I knew who'd, mm -hmm. who'd worked with her. It was, it was like a, um, yeah. My friend Christian Brighty who debuted the year before, um, had really recommended to work with them. So that mm -hmm. was like kind of, yeah, the, the reason, but it was, I mean, it was interesting seeing what you, what you don't have to spend money on. That was kind of a really interesting thing for me. Cause it's kind of, everyone talks about the costs so much and then actually the one big thing I didn't do was get like the big posters that everybody oh, gets yeah. I just didn't do that and yeah. and I kind of realized like it's good but it's sort of 
then mainly just an Instagram opportunity yeah, like yeah. it was like this crazy it was that. I was like oh no one actually like cares about them no one's mm, looking at them because mm, there's so many of them so many so then I was like oh you just actually don't like invest in like a good PR and a flyering team like don't do mm. that don't do those don't do those <laughs> that, that's like there the, you heard it here yeah, yeah. anyone self-producing you don't need those big posters I mean maybe you do I don't it's you know it's a mix of things because it is like if you have an amazing poster and you haven't had a Soho run and, yes. you know, whatever. So it's it's also, you know, it's very specific, like, where you're at and what you need or don't need. Um, I think it's interesting. I have definitely decided not to go see a show because I didn't like the poster. Um, yeah. But I've also done, yeah. maybe I've done the opposite. No, I'm not me sure. Too. I, I definitely have done that as well. Yeah. That, that a, post, a good poster definitely changes everything, I, I think. I think in it's, Edinburgh... I, I think I would agree entirely with your statement, especially if you did it on your iPhone and you're, you know, it's a bad photo. Oh, yeah. I've Don't seen blow those. That up. And yeah. I'm like, yeah. Why did you, uh, that you're spending so, so much. much money? Yeah. And you, you didn't and you spend money on a photographer. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. When you do think, you're like, <laughs> these people have a skill set. Utilize. Anyway, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's yeah. me being like yeah. horrible. Yeah. But. Work with people. I think that is like the, the biggest thing is being like, yeah, actually that is massive. I think if, if I was going to say anything about like people kind of debuting and people having people going with very little understanding of what makes a good run and what mm. makes a good like PR campaign, what makes a good, whatever, mm. all of those things, I think th the biggest thing would just be like, just don't do it by yourself. Like, I think that is really it. is like as much as, um, you know, I understand that, like, if you don't have some support from other places, then, like, getting to work with other people f who f paying for their time is, like, impossible as well. I do understand that that's, like, the biggest problem there. But I do think, like, if you are if you are paying to be there and do the fringe in the first place and going, like, I'm going to do this, then, like, do it when you can with all that, with the people around you and with support. Don't. Like, I think the worst mistake you can make is doing it by being like, I'm just going to do this by mm. myself. I'm going to do everything. And I'm going to like, yeah, make my own costume, make my own poster, like yeah. pay for all this, like try and do my own PR. Try and like, it's just like, you're setting yourself up for like the biggest burnout and like, and yeah, there are other people who can do those things better than you can. So, yes. Like, <laughs> I mean, and we, you know, like, I'm not saying you have to go to the top photographer i'm sure you have a friend who's very yes. handy with yeah. a camera yeah. and a photoshop yeah. you know yeah, yeah yeah um yeah i mean yeah. i remember i well, i did a show a few years ago and took it to brighton and the image got us through so many doors you know gets you on yes new, yeah. in newspaper yeah, because yeah, yeah, they yeah, like yeah. the photo yeah. it looks like you, yeah. and actually i was thinking just as you were saying that i know you were saying you didn't do the posters but your images are great thank you uh, they I mean, tell they, me exactly yeah, what i'm getting yeah, yeah, yeah. they but, they give me that little yeah little touch of what what am i about to yeah. experience it was uh, yeah that was i think again because like so laurie is also a designer mm. and i think both of us in in all of the work that we do, I think the image is like so important. I think mm -hmm. it's like, it's always kind of one of the first things that we're thinking about is how is this going to look and what are we, and especially with kind of puppetry and characters and costumes and things as well. It's just, it's, it's always such an early thing in the process as well as being like, how does this look? How does this function? How does this, yeah. What, what is this in, in a really visual way? Mm. So then it's fun to get to like think about that, you know, it means that marketing isn't this kind of weird, mysterious job because you know that you have already something exciting to look at that you can sell. It's not kind of, I find it so funny seeing like stand-ups posters every year and yeah. being like, where did they get this concept? It's just got like <laughs> nothing to do with their show, but I guess they, you know, they need something really visual. And then like that versus like shows where, it is someone doing something really visual and cloudy or whatever. And you're like, okay, I know with them, like they are going to be dressed as a cloud in yes, this show. Yeah, yeah. Like that is actually what they're doing. It's not that they're like, I'm going to arrive and they're going to be doing a stand up show, even though like on their poster, they were a, uh, you know, yeah. kite or something. Yeah. You know? like, yeah it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so funny. Like seeing everyone get creative just on the poster, like yeah. the image of the poster. You're like, dress like that on stage. <laughs> yeah. Like, it looks and they great. come out in like, jeans and a t shirt yeah. and they're like, hey, I've been thinking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And I wonder if we might be able to meet Brew. Yeah, she's here. She's here. We can do it. Oh, it'd be so great. We'll take your time getting Thank her you. ready. We'll, she needs a minute. She needs a minute. Uh -huh. She needs a minute. To fix your face. <laughs> oh, God. It's not doing any favors. <laughs> Hi, Brew. Hi. Oh. Hi. Nice to see you. Wow, it's so nice to meet you in person. It's nice to meet you. How do I? I'm trying to check myself on monitors. You look. No, don't be so vain. Gorgeous. <laughs> you look it's gorgeous. So early in the day for me. Yeah. <laughs> You're a bit of a night puppet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm rock night and roll. Witch. I'm a night witch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Brew, I was wondering, we were about to talk about um, about Lockie's next show, Wonder Twunk. Are you are you in that? No, I don't want to talk about that show. You're, you're not a, you're not a part of the show. It's a bit of a sore subject. Oh. oh, no, it's quite nice. I'm kind of enjoying the break. Yeah, it's kind of good for me to get to. You know, we can have space. I might even work on a solo show while he's off doing that. And, you should. You know, I'd come see it. Thank you. You know, I feel like he's holding you back. Uh, it's only a matter of time before <laughs> I ditch him. I'm gonna replace him probably with. Chalamet or someone, you know, I, I need a better twink. twink. Oh my goodness. upgrade, I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, maybe you could, Brew, could you tell me what what the word twunk actually means? I know I'm not talking about the show, just I, when I was mm. Googling it mm. um, to be prepared for this, I, I, I actually found varying uh, answers there, to that question. There are different answers. Yeah. I think the one that Lockie likes is it's the, uh, wait, let me get it. I've got to get it the right way around. It's the... <laughs> Face of a twink and the body of a hunk. Yes. That's, okay. Yeah. That is the nicer. I think that's the nicer version yeah, of it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. So that's kind of inspired the new thing. And Lockie's going down. At, I said, why am I doing your PR now? And I'm <laughs> speaking on behalf of all of your ideas. Um, yeah, Lockie's doing a kind of sci-fi thing with that. A circusy sci-fi show. That's the next thing that Lachlan's working on. But ah. it's, yeah, it's got nothing to do with me. Oh. I mean, maybe he'll let me direct. I'd like to direct the next one. You've really. got ambitions as a director. Yeah, I, I think it's time for me to branch out. You, you know, I, mm. I, 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 you know, everyone knows that I can lead a show now. Mm. It's been said many times. Most of the reviews said that I was the real star at the show. Most people said that I shouldn't have left the stage for the second half of the show. That oh, yeah, was, I was sad about that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I was... So I was, were, you know, so was The Guardian. And but we were glad you came back. I do come back. You did I don't get a bow, though. I, I don't even get to come on at the curtain call. That is shocking. It is true. That and is shocking. It's, yeah. yeah. I've, it's something that I've genuinely received, like, messages <laughs> about on Instagram. Like, quite a lot of people being like, I love the show, but why did she not get to come back on at the end and like why does she have a bow i know so messed up also where can we catch you both in mm. voices of evil going forward yeah the show will it's funny because we said that the last london run was the last london yeah. run and it's always a lie whenever <laughs> anyone says that it's always a freaking lie uh, yeah it's true <laughs> um yeah but i think it will be back in london at some point in, and park theater which Park Theatre is Wonder Twunk that I'm doing. Ah, yeah, that one is. Okay. Yeah, that's in July, which, yeah, it's 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 a bit, the, my brain is all over the place with these two things right now, but it's, yeah, yeah. Park ha Theatre is without you. Sorry about that. I'm oh, not going to be there. Not no, that well, that's a real shame. Um, will any other, will we meet any other new, I mean, I'm sorry, <gasps> Brew, will there be any other new characters? There will be new characters, yeah, there's, I know, it's so messed up. He's Cheating like, on you. It's really, he thinks that he can be this, like, pocket polyamorous, you know, <laughs> I don't like it. I want, I want monogamy as a partner. It's <laughs> <laughs> not like that. <laughs> inspires you what inspires your work is there other artists that you're like this is what you know what I enjoy watching yeah yeah I think yeah I think in terms of like what inspires me it's a lot of like very cartoony stupid stuff I think that's like whenever I'm sort of at a sort of dead end it's very easy to kind of be like okay then like watch you know literally watch kind of like Warner Brothers cartoons or The Muppet Show or something like that and it's kind of easy to kind of come back to a place of being like oh yeah this is meant to be fun and stupid don't take it too seriously mm. that's kind of 
a useful sort of way in, I think, for me as inspiration. But also, like, stories, I think a lot of kind of, um, I don't know, I like, actually increasingly the kind of, like, magic realism and horror and those kind of genres, I think, are definitely kind of quite big inspiration for the kind of, the, again, the kind of worlds that I want to build and the things that I want to do. So that's, like... Yeah, lots of, yeah, Stephen King, Angela Carter, those kind of, like, uh, it's kind of nice to also start from those kind of things and be a bit like, okay, is there a way to do, like, a ventriloquist show that feels like one of those novels mm. or something? I think also just, like, queer joy really, I think, is, like, massive. I think that's, like, the kind of, the best shows of Voices of Evil that I can think of are ones where I've been, like, great this is like the queerest audience <laughs> in the world and they are so up for everything from the very start and it just means that you can have so much fun in the hour and just like yeah really go crazy and mm. yeah it just brings a whole other sort of texture to the show I think mm. whenever I really really am like a bit depressed by like the comedy industry and the kind of slightly more industry side of it and the kind of thing of being like oh god this is competitive this is hard this is like mm. doesn't feel sustainable or this what you know these things are really tough about it I think if I'm lacking inspiration that's kind of the the a nice thing to to come back to is this like thing of being like tell a queer story in a really fun way just just think about that like just think about can you talk about a queer experience in the most stupid and fun way that they're gonna like get on these levels and that's it sounds really wanky to say it like that but I'm like no, I it's think actually that's really lovely and, um, and and heartwarming I'll, I'll be honest I, it's so funny that it, it's heartwarming when then you see the show and <laughs> the it's show like so silly. and it's completely deranged and you've got blood <laughs> all over your face and it does <laughs> not and that's who, I guess that's who you're making for as well when you when you start. I guess because yeah, it's you you're making for. Making it for myself. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, and I think that's like the thing that with Voices of Evil, that, that's what surprised me the most about it, I think, was being like, this feels from the beginning so niche. Like just being like, I can't, be, like how, how are we going to sell this <laughs> thing that's like a, you know, Muppety horror <laughs> queer show? But then, like, realising that there are so many people that have, a, like, hunger for something that weird yeah. is just lovely. Like, it's just really cool. It's cool to know that you can make stuff for yourself and mm. that you will then see yourself reflected in the people that are into it. Like, that's, I, I haven't ever experienced that before with anything that I'd ever, you know, done before this show. So it was it was really cool to do that. I'm always up for, like, for me silly or stupid is a really great entry point if something's just a little bit like yeah. dumb or crazy yeah. i'm i'm in yeah like i enjoy I, that yeah. i think it's essential i yeah. think it's so essential i don't really yeah i i every now and then it depends what kind of jobs i'm doing but because of spending so much time in this world in the comedy world and clown like you know most truly the weirdest thing in the world to be able to be like most of my friends are clowns <laughs> <laughs> but like they are and then it's so interesting every now and then sort of dipping into other things and realizing just how serious other people are mm. I kind of haven't been part of that <laughs> world for a long time and so it is really yeah it makes me realize how much I'm like wow this is essential to the way that I think uh, that I live and I, I, I find it surprising that people don't laugh as much yeah. as I do on a daily basis like yeah. it's yeah it, uh, yeah it, I think everyone should bring in the stupid. I was going to ask you to teach me a tiny bit of ventriloquism. Oh, I, I, could do, I could do a couple like, in, like letters. Yeah. We could, yeah, oh, we, yeah can we yeah. try? Yeah, I'd love yeah. to learn. Yeah, yeah. I could do a couple letters. That'd be fun. Until Mello comes back. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until we get kicked out. Yeah, up. we get kicked out. Um, uh, okay, so the... Okay, I'll try and do it in one sentence. This is really funny. The The hardest sentence I think you can say is, who dared to put wet fruit... You're giving me the hardest I'm giving, sentence? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. We're going to start with the hardest. <laughs> We're going but, hard. Because it has all of the letters that you can't okay, say. Okay. So I can then say what each one should be. Yeah, yeah. Um, who dared to put 
wet fruit bat poo in our mummy's bed. Okay. That's the sentence. And I'm not allowed to move. It would be who dared to put with a K. So it's like a K that like I'm really telling all the secrets now. The ventriloquist society is gonna like come for me. They're gonna be like, don't tell everyone how it works. Um it's a yeah, like a kind of soft K. Can we just try that? Yeah. I think that's probably enough. Uh Uh-huh. Don't wanna try put. Am I or okay, you could do like you could do a whole P sentence. It's like you could do like Polly put the kettle on, which okay. is all the K. Yeah, all the So I'm, I keep my mouth closed. Oh, yeah. So sorry. That's like first. So the first thing is kind of I would put your teeth together, mm-hmm. like gent- not like mm-hmm. clenched, but like firm so they're not going to like open. Mm-hmm. Um, and then lips just slightly apart. Like that's okay. kind of just like a little bit like as relaxed as you can. Yeah. It's a weird face actually to do. It, and it's a weird yeah. thing that like this is like the Kung like mm-hmm. resting face, but mm-hmm. it's like. Um, yeah, and then and then with that, you can try saying Polly put. Uh, you can <laughs> actually smile a little bit actually as okay. well. It's, it's it's kind of okay to certain <laughs> things if it's like really hard to push the sound out. You can smile a little bit. So I say. <laughs> so I go. Polly. Try, try, this is the thing is that you, your brain wants to straight away go to the lips because you're so used to yeah. that being P. But imagine that the sentence literally is. Holly put the okay. kettle on. It's like all K that you're not using any like. Holly cut the kettle. I think that was terrible. terrible. No, that was all right. I think that was okay that was for my right. first. I'm gonna work on that. Was that. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I'll see you next year at Edinburgh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> this is like more ventriloquists. <laughs> more ventriloquists. Yeah. All the bloody reviews that always just want to like compare me to Nina Conti that's like the, and oh. I'm always like what two of us is too many yeah, is that yeah, like yeah, the, like yeah. what is this that it's there's very like diff- you do very different very things. different yeah. very different and she's guess- so wonderful I like it's it's so she- annoying to me because we, like I've I love her so much I love mm-hmm. everything that she does and it's so nice to like kind of know her now a little bit but oh, every wow. time that one of these freaking reviews comes out I always like I feel like I want to message her being like I'm sorry it's not like <laughs> I haven't told them to like you write that like yeah. this is so weird that they always are like Nina Conti used to be the only cool ventriloquist yeah. and you're like what no one's saying this about the stand up no exactly <laughs> there's only allowed to be two yeah two stand ups this guy seems to be talking about the same stuff as this yeah, guy yeah 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 exactly yeah they're really samey yeah. like talk about them yeah. being the same as, exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Lachlan. Thank you. I've thank taken, you. I've really enjoyed talking to you thank today. Thank you so much. Me too. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Make It Work podcast. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our podcast so we can keep bringing you these great chats. In the meantime, keep making it work. See you next time. <laughs>